Hello, I'm Helene Thayer on Occupy Boston TV, and this is Occupy Live. According to the 2008 report of the Pew Charitable Trust, there are more than 2.4 million people incarcerated in the United States prisons and jails. Of this total, black men make up over 1.3 million, thus accounting for more than half of the total, even though African Americans comprise only 12% of the U.S. population. My guest today is Reverend George Walter Slayen, whose book Locked Up and Locked Down formed the impetus for the creation of the Center for Church and Prison. The Center for Church and Prison is a resource and research center working towards community revitalization through prison reform. Welcome, Reverend Walter Slayer. How Thank do you, you do? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Wonderful. So is it true that the crime rate is going down while the incarceration rate is going up? And what are the factors that could explain that? Yes, uh, um, as the stati statistics reflects, uh, right now the United States has 5% of the world's uh, population, but 25% of the world's incarcerated population. And what has happened is that over the years, uh, what we've, and the FBI has attested to this as well, that crime has reduced remarkably all over the United States at a rate at, at 40%. However, in contrast to that, what we have all over the United States in several states is the increase in mass incarceration, which has become quite problematic over the years. How do you explain this incredible increase uh, in, in incorporate, uh, incarceration in the United States? What, what are the factors that are leading to that? Well, obviously, uh, there is no uh, comparison. And that the tally between reduction in crime and increase in mass incarceration is, is, is absent. So then what we look at with respect to uh, the, the, the reasons for the increase in mass incarceration, one, People have talked about the war on drugs, the war on drugs, which has absolutely fundamentally uh, affected minority communities all over the United States. And not only the war on drugs, but you also have what is often referred to as a racial preference in the sentencing process based on the statistics you, you, you're seeing. And not only that, there are other factors with respect to high rate of incarceration of nonviolent crimes uh, that is associated with drugs. Okay, take for instance, the fastest growing amount of people that are now being incarcerated are women, especially black women, for the use of drugs, not the trading of drugs, you see, but for the use of drugs. So you've got all of that informing the, 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 the rate of mass incarceration together with that, especially based on the statistics you've just read, for black men, you have the criminalization of black men in the U.S. Uh, social consciousness as well, that, uh, these factors, the racial factors, the, the, the war on drugs, and a couple of other factors have also uh, contributed to that. Now, in light of that, you also have poverty, you have also have illiteracy, you have uh, a couple of other problems. I mean, individual responsibility must be taken into consideration as well. So you mentioned that there is a uh, inequality in the way some of the crimes are sentenced, so that even though black people and white people might be convicted, they're not sentenced in the same way. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of research uh, has come up with respect to the use of drugs and the distinction between crack cocaine and part of the cocaine, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, how evident it becomes when, 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 when a black guy is caught with drugs and the process and the extent to which he's criminalized immediately, you know, and, you know, sent to jail, sentenced to a long term. In jail, in contrast to a white guy who may be caught with powder cocaine, okay, and using the same thing, but he's the sentence giving a lesser sentence or easily sent to a rehab, you know, uh, and less on a, on a, on a skill, uh, uh, not, not, not absolutely criminalized as the minority guy would be criminalized. So all of these factors has, have uh, contributed to the high rate of incarceration as well. So how is that affecting the black community? Well, mass incarceration uh, has immediate implications on the minority communities, especially the black community. And when we talk about mass incarceration, there are three categories of people who must begin to look at. One, blacks, and you've got Hispanics, and you've got poor whites as well, okay? Poor whites that have also experienced the brunt of the sentencing process uh, uh, in this country. But then with respect to the black community, you have one, uh, the implication evident in the uh, what we call a social implication 
Okay, the breakdown of the black family structure, increase in fatherlessness, increase in single mothers. Uh, you have mothers working two, three jobs and taking care of kids while fathers are behind. Again, to go back to the, to the statistics you, you read, uh, blacks are 12 to 13 percent, however, make up an overwhelming amount, especially men in the U.S. criminal justice system. And then you have also the economic implications. Uh, talking about the impl economic implications, the Pew Charitable Trust has talked about what is referred to as uh, generational impoverishment. Okay, because it's difficult since you've got a lot of black guys and a lot of minority men who are easily uh, criminalized and, 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 and sentenced to long-term sentences. What you also find is that the ability to come back into the society mm -hmm. so as to, and then the possibility for them to, for them to uh, uh, attain some kind of economic mobility has become very, very difficult for them. They are affected by quarry, their criminal records, so employment is less. And so as a result of that, you have increase in, in impoverishment and poverty and marginalization from the social structure, you see. And not only that, you also have the health implication as well, increase in mental health issues. Uh, like Senator Jim Webb has talked about the U.S. prison system where you have a lot of people who are affected by AIDS, HIV, uh, tuberculosis, syphilis, mental health. So all of these problems are evident in the U.S. Uh, criminal justice system, prison system, mm -hmm. as a result of mass incarceration. Yes, when I uh, was looking at your website recently, I noticed that you're going to have a guest, uh, Michelle Alexander, who has uh, written the book, The New Jim Crow. Uh, coming to speak at one of your events uh, in October. And I was listening to what she said. She was talking about the uh, comparison to men, uh, black men at the time of slavery and now that it's uh, actually more people, more black men are impacted by this prison system than they were even at the, the height of the slave market. Yes, uh, Michelle Alexander, again, uh, she will be coming in October from the 18th to the 20th of October when we will be having our uh, first annual conference on mass incarceration and reentry. So we're quite excited of, about the fact that she'll be coming to Boston. But much more so, what the, the argument she talks about in her book, which is The New Jim Crow, A Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness, what the argument she puts forth is that what we now have in the U.S. criminal justice system is patterned after the days of Jim Crow, the black code when blacks were, 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 were immediately arrested, you know, arbitrarily arrested in several instances and, 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 and sentenced to long-term sentences behind bars and then used for cheap labor, okay? So, and, and she talks about that as well. And, and so what, she, what she's saying also with respect to her argument is that you have a comparable slave uh, uh, trading process going on right here in, in the 21st century in America. In, com in comparing that to the to 1850, and people and so, don't realize that yeah. that that comparison is so close. Yeah, it is, and so and 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 she she argues that the amount of black men now that are behind bars in the United States prison system are far more than what it was in 1850. Now, obviously, 1850, black men were either on the field, you know, as slaves, and or they were behind bars. As well, so if you look at if you look at it, it's very scary, and, uh, and I think it's a travesty when we when you take into consideration the level, the the, the pristine constitutional principles of the American Constitution and democracy, that this United States could double in such uh, in such uh, a process, uh, a mass incarceration of people in the 21st century. When we thought we had solved the slavery problem, and that was behind us, and yeah. that you know was no longer. A concern of ours. Yes, and it's in that light that we, the Center for Church and Praise, and not only do we do we embark on strategic intervention, uh, but we also focus on educating the populace as well, the public, about the, the the issue of mass incarceration because we feel it's it's not only a black thing, it's an Hispanic thing, it's a white thing, poor white, but it's a humanitarian issue. You see the level at which mass incarceration has grown in the United States. Yeah, I have some figures here that show that the United States is hands down at the top of the list for a percentage of people incarcerated. There are 686 per 100,000 in the United States. That is the highest of any country. And then you go to the uh, first world countries, especially in Europe, where 
Australia is 116 uh, per 100,000, Canada 102, uh, Germany 96, France 85. It, it just goes down from there. It's astonishing. It's like a six to one ratio. And there doesn't seem to be any logic to it. Yeah, uh, a, a lot of people have looked at it, uh, especially in light of the fact that you've got a huge 40% reduction in crime all over the United States. However, you, on the other hand, you've got this, this great increase in mass incarceration. And one other factor that I must say that has also contributed to mass incarceration in the U.S. prison system is the privatization of prison. Okay? Oh, yes. And on that particular note, you want to talk about the industrialization of the U.S. prison system and as a, as a, as purely, as a pure economic venture. Okay, and, and in talking about that, you have two of the major, two of the major prison, private prison corporations, that's GEO and CEA. At the end of 2010, they made close to $3 billion, okay, just a, a, a banking and bondage, so to speak, a misery. But mm. uh, they, they profit a lot from, from mass incarceration. So it's in that light that we want to highlight the need for more public awareness that it's an humanitarian issue we feel it's quite immoral and it's quite unethical that the United States would dabble in such a, a, a rate of incarceration of people. Yeah, I saw some of the figures uh, throughout the United States. The uh, GEO, I think, has 116 facilities, but it also has facilities across the globe as well. And uh, one of the things, we do have a chart of that, which I hopefully they'll put up shortly, um, showing some of the locations where you have very, very high percentage of prisoners in the private privatization system. One of the things that I've heard, and maybe you can tell me if that's correct or not, is that when you have um, prisons making a profit, you also have prisons getting into the business of affecting laws to make the sentences longer, to make the, uh, the charges stricter, to make it more likely that people will be put in jail and stay there so they can make a profit. I personally cannot imagine anything more immoral or more distressing than the thought of a profit being made out of people losing their freedom. Well, you're, you're right. Private prison thrives on longer sentences, harsh punitive sentences, and uh, uh, that would, would less focus on rehabilitation. So take, for instance, California. In 1994, when California passed the Three Strikes Law, at that particular time, California had one of the best prison systems. The focus was on rehabilitation. But after the passage of the Three Strikes uh, uh, Bill into law, immediately my, uh, California's prison industry, I mean prison system, just grew exponentially. And what happened next was the infiltration, the, the appearing of private prisons. They took advantage of it immediately. And so right now, California has in its correctional system about 163,000 uh, individuals behind bars. And the Supreme Court has mandated California to reduce its prison population. Otherwise, the Supreme Court will step in. So private prisons strive on longer sentences, harsh punitive measures, because the lobby for them, you see, the lobby for them, and that's the only way for them to remain in business. You see, so it is important for people to be aware that whilst on the one hand private prison profit, they also lobby for harsh punitive measures. And it's in that particular light we are arguing about uh, Massachusetts, and we should talk about Massachusetts. Yes. Uh, which is a uh, I would like a to hear bill. what you are doing here because I know your center is very involved. I uh, visited your website, as I told you, and I saw a wonderful picture of many, many, mostly women and people from your, your church and your center who have been receiving a reward for the work they've been doing in various types of prison reform, prison policy, and things like that. So I'd like you to tell us about your center, what you're doing, and then about the free, three strikes. Situation. Okay, the Center for Church and Prison, our focus is community revitalization through prison reform and strategic solution development and intervention in the high rates of incarceration and recidivism rates, especially for men and women of color as well, uh, for, for, for people. So what we do is strategic intervention at public policy level. Uh, our goal is transforming, informing public policy with respect to prison reform. What we also do is direct intervention with, with, with respect to people behind bars, highlighting the need for more creation of jobs, for creation of jobs for people with quarry, 
And we also, we also do a lot of work with respect to uh, educating the populace, the community as well, about the implication of mass incarceration. And then we also conduct uh, job fairs for people with Cori, because in Massachusetts, people with Cori find it absolutely difficult for them to get jobs. So we, we, we highlight the need for that. Take, for instance, last year, uh, on, the, on the 19th of February, we did a job fair. And we, we thought we're just doing a little simple thing, okay? But it was a job fair for people with Cori. But by, by 12 o'clock, we had close to 750 individuals looking for jobs. Now, that's just a minute amount of individuals in the Commonwealth in Massachusetts looking for jobs with Cori. Okay, you can think about the huge implications of that. So, what we do, we also try to connect with other individuals in the community that are doing a lot of work behind bars. So the picture you saw on the, on the, on the website, which is churchandprison.org, was a launching program of the Center for Church and Prison where we were recognizing the good work of some of the individuals that have been working assiduously, I mean, uh, very hard. It, with people with Corey doing re-entry work behind bars and highlighting the need for more strategic Would you explain to people a little bit more about Corey, how that works, what it is? Corey is criminal record offended information. Once a person is sentenced, once you can even be before a judge, you may get a Corey. Some people, some people have Corey, uh, a criminal records, but they've never been to jail. Okay, yeah. the implication of that in Massachusetts is that once you have a quarry and you go to look for jobs, it becomes absolutely difficult for you to get a job because first thing, prior to 2010, they, there would be a box on the application, the, 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 the job application that says, do you have a quarry? Once you say yes, I mean, immediately it just, it just, it just uh, uh, discredits you for, for, the, for the job, immediate, disqualifies you for the job immediately. So there was a core reform that, that took place last uh, uh, 2010. However, that particular core reform, it was not, it did not emphasize the possibility of jobs creation, you see, with no emphasis on job, it just said ban the box so that the box would not be on the application. But some uh, employers are still doing it. So if you have a quarry, it becomes absolutely difficult to get a job. Now, on a racial level, the highest amount of those uh, with quarry that are finding it absolutely difficult to get a job are minority men in, 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 in Massachusetts. So, and all over the nation as well, you see. So these are some of the difficulties for people when they have quarry, for them to, even if they were sentenced for the most nonviolent crime, for them to reintegrate adequately becomes absolutely difficult, you know. And then, of course, what are they faced with as a way to make a living? And right. They're, they're put into an impossible position. Yeah, and as a result of that, we feel that people should be given the possibility, the opportunity for them to experience some form of economic mobility. They've paid their time to the state <coughs> for their sentences and for the crime. They must be given the possibility to make some money to so the lives So if that's part together. of what you're working on is to help to reintegrate people into jobs and into the community? Yes, uh, we do a lot of reentry work. We do a lot of educational work, public policy, policy work, but we advocate for adequate reintegration policies as well for people that are coming out of prisons, but then also on the preventive level, and then uh, the, the need for more uh, strategic rehabilitation programs for them for, uh, in behind bars for people. Do you have any message for people in general and including employers about a way to help with this, to help to integrate and to bring people into their jobs and still feel safe and secure about it? Well, we feel that, okay, so once a person has a quarry, sometimes they say once the person is a fe has a felony, it, it, people must be given a second chance, okay? Now, we know that people are concerned about community security and public safety. On the other hand, people must be given a second chance because the criminal is still a human being. I strongly believe the criminal is still a human being as much as the offended person is a human being. And the person who committed a crime is a potential candidate for redemption, you see? But if the person is not given the opportunity for them to put their lives back together, for them to make some, to earn some money so that they can, they can, they can be able to experience economic mobility, it becomes difficult because they go back to crime and, and violence. But what and can people do to help that happen? So what we want people to do, give an opportunity to someone who you see has the potential to, to, to make changes in their lives. Give them an opportunity, employ him if you can. 
And then uh, if the, you see the person is very honest, the person is sincere, give him the opportunity for, them, for him to have a job and to experience some kind of economic mobility. Perhaps they could come to your center and get advice about some of the people who might make good employees? Sure. They can give us a call. Give, give us a call. My number is 781-233-1528. <laughs> you can also go on our website, which is churchandprison.org, okay. churchandprison.org. Send us an email or give us a call uh, if you're interested, and we'll be highly appreciated, yeah. uh, appreciative of it. I, I want to get to the three strikes, but I just do want to suggest to everybody to please go to the website because it is full of all kinds of data, statistics, information, and background. So tell us about the three strikes. I know you've been working very hard on that, and you did a press conference at the State House this month, I think it was. Right. Um, so tell us about that issue, what you're trying to do, and maybe about the press conference. Okay, so at this particular moment, there are three bills, well, four bills uh, that are in the conference committee. Massachusetts State House and uh, Senate and House, House of Representatives, considering uh, enacting a three strikes uh, 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 law, an obituary offender law. So on the, on the 10th of November, the Senate passed the, 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 Senate, the, the Senate version of the three strikes bill. Okay. And then after what, a week after, after that, they, it went to the House and the House of Representatives passed it as well. And so the, both bills are now with the conference committee. And the conference wow. committee's responsibility is to reconcile those bills. So it just went zoomed through and then also you've got the governor's bill, which is serving as a frame of reference, two bills from the governor that are serving as frames of reference for, for those bills. That are, they are all with the, the, the conference committee at this particular moment. Now, the implication of that, because of the implication of three strikes law, and we know longer sentences and harsh punitive measures, we know that it undermines public safety and long-term community security. Okay, so briefly, let me just read some of the things what these three strikes will do will increase parole eligibility from 15 to 25 years, will increase life without parole, will increase the class of individuals considered habitual offenders in Massachusetts, will limit the discretion of judges to judge each case based on its own merit, will legislate a maximum penalty for several offenses without taking into consideration other important factors in the sentencing process, will impose, long t will impose mandatory post-release supervision on all who have wrapped up their time in addition to the burden of quarry. Lower level criminals will serve mandatory maximum sentences. And we know that the implication of this, taking the, the what this bill is also going to do, is going to take the, the discretionary power from judges. So that a blanket sentencing for the third offense is just going to absolutely just cover your third offense. Okay? And not only that, but take for instance, a person, your second offense, you spend uh, two days. You spend two days in the, in, in the county or state jail. For this particular law, if it passes, it does not take into consider any mitigating factors, okay? But if you spend two days for your second offense, for your third offense, you are having 25 years, you see? Mm -hmm. And we feel on the long term it's too expensive. Take for instance, Massachusetts is right now suffering from a overcrowded prison, okay? In both the state and county prison, Massachusetts has close to 25,000 people behind bars. And Massachusetts spends uh, 47,000 dollars annually on one image and then Massachusetts also spends ten thousand dollars for one K to twelve child. Think about misplaced priority. Okay? Mm. So that's what's happened. We feel that these particular bills are going to burden taxpayers and we feel it undermines public safety in the long term. And so we are asking people in, in, in all over to call their representatives, call your senators, tell them you oppose this bill. It's it's, uh, it undermines public safety, and ask them that, tell them, because this is what we are proposing. We want a comprehensive sentencing reform bill. A comprehensive sentencing reform bill, look, bill looks at a sentencing from a very holistic perspective. What is a holistic perspective? One that looks at prevention prior to the person being going, uh, before the person goes in. One that looks at reduction in mass incarceration, that also looks at rehabilitation, and adequate reintegration of the former inmates. So when they come out, they will not have their chances of going back to prison will be less, you see. Well, one of the things that I noticed from what you were saying, uh, two things actually. First, that it sounds like we're going to have more uh, people in our prisons based on the experience of California, exactly. which is exactly what we don't need. And in addition to that, we have a, a really, 
a large problem because, um, sorry, I think I lost my train of thought. Take it away, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you. Well, yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, in, again, like I said. Oh, we... I know what it was. I'm very concerned because it's far along in the process. If, if it went through both the House and the Senate, that means that it actually, the conference committee is supposed to blend them together. So right. it's very close. It sounds from what you said, unless I under, misunderstood you, it's that it's close to becoming law. It's right close now, to it's becoming a law. Very and, serious. And, and as a result of that, we have, we have mounted a lot of public campaigns against it. People have been calling. And the reason why it has been delayed is because people have been calling their senators and the representatives and members of the conference committee as well. So if you're listening to this, we want you to kindly call your state representative, okay. kindly call your state senator and tell them you oppose the three strikes bill. It's with the conference committee and the conference committee job is to reconcile those bills. But they themselves, their back are against the wall. They consider because a lot of people, religious groups and organizations, civic organizations and, and prison advocate uh, reform groups have lifted up their voices to say, look, this thing undermines public safety in the long term. So we want mm -hmm. you to join the fray, call your senator and your representative yes. and tell them you oppose it. This is very, very serious and obviously working through your church and other organizations and community, uh, you know, links that you have, maybe we can turn that around. Yeah, we hope so. We, we're really working assiduously and, and, and with other organizations and individuals behind the scene as well. Uh, but we want the populace, the, the, the people of Massachusetts, to raise their voices and call the, the governor. Because one thing, yeah, not on the, only that, if the bill passes, uh, they, if the conference committee decides and sends it on, on, on the reconciled bill, they're going to send it back to the Senate. And the Senate will have to vote on it again and take an up and down vote. Okay, mm -hmm. and if it passes in the Senate, it goes to the to the House, and the House also going to take an, an up and down vote, and then it comes back to the governor. If it comes to the governor, we want the governor to veto it. You see, but is there the, any chance that he might do that? We are hoping, but if the if the community if people call and say, yes. look, we want you to veto it, he might. But if he vetoes it, it requires a a a, a, a good amount of senators to 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 vote for that veto to uphold the veto. You see, so this is the, this is the complex issue. So the senators must be called, state representatives must be called to say, look, we oppose this. Yes, I would like to see people uh, bring this idea to their own churches because right. uh, that seems like one really good path right. uh, where a group of people can get together and understand the issue. Right. Um, is, is there anything else you wanted to say uh, to wrap things up? Well, uh, what we also want to say is that, again, as we think about this particular bill, our goal is to argue for a comprehensive sentencing reform that looks at prevention, that looks at reduction in mass incarceration, that looks at rehabilitation, and that looks at adequate reintegration of the former inmates. You can visit our website as well, churchandprison.org, or give us a call, 781-233-1528. Now, on the 28th of this month, there is going to be a, a hearing, a major hearing. Uh, Ch Councillor Charles Yancey submitted a resolution at the, in the chamber at, the, at City Hall that the city of Boston will oppose the three strikes bill. And so as a result of this, a hearing has been scheduled on the 28th at the State House on the fifth floor. Uh, and we, will, we, we want you to come to this particular hearing and raise your voice and testify against this three strikes bill that, this, that the city of Boston opposes it. So you're also trying to get the city council to pass a resolution right. opposing this bill. Exactly. So that's another really important way that people can participate. Yes, and we feel that if the city of Boston opposes it and, and uh, based on the resolution, other cities can, pa can pick it up as well. And, 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 and Brooklyn can begin to raise its voice, its voice and tell the, the senators and representatives that we oppose this as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure if anyone needs support in that, they can contact your center. Um, I will, I'm hoping that we'll be following up with this interview uh, in a few weeks with another interview with uh, Harold Adams, who is with the Committee of Friends and Relatives of Prisoners. I'd like to look in more in depth with him at some of the effects that it does have on the community and on the people and on the women and you know the children. So it's been really wonderful having you here. And uh, I hope to see you again. It's a pleasure. Thank you for the Thank opportunity. You. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.